welcome to Sagas and Sass Season 3. I'm Tara, along with fellow hosts Nick, Jonathan, and Nami. This episode will cover Part 3 of Arm of the Sphinx, the second installment of Josiah Bancroft's Books of Babel series. If you're watching live, join us in the chat, or after the fact, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Sagas and Sass to continue the conversation. And just a reminder, the views expressed in the show are those of the hosts as individuals and do not necessarily represent the show as a whole. We're back with Arm of the Sphinx and ready to delve into its oh-so-revelatory part, third part, The Bottomless Library. When last we left our intrepid crew, Senlin was insisting that they needed to face their bullies, which in their case means basically playing dead to get up to the Sphinx's lair and then flashing what they hope is the appropriate signal. That being showing off Ea's arm to gain entrance. The first part of their plan works, but the second part, which involves Adam, Aren, Valetta, and the remaining with the stone cloud, while Senlin and Edith confront the Sphinx, doesn't turn out quite so well. Sure, they land in the Sphinx's docking bay, but then a mechanical titan dumps them out of the stone cloud and absconds with the ship. They are then approached by Byron, a stag man mechanical hybrid who knows but who knows but clearly does not like edith byron does at least lead them to the sphinx who hilariously does not look like edith described him that being like a spoon the sphinx immediately begins berating edith for not taking care of the arm he gave her but senlin interrupts announcing that he has information about moret and his hot army the sphinx counters with the fact that he has information about Mar myra and attempts to convince senlin to betray his friends Senlin refuses and is actually able to surprise the Sphinx with the information that Marat has five copies of Ogier's painting, which we find out is called the Bricklayer's Granddaughter, in his possession. This leads to Senlin and the Sphinx haggling out a contract, but as it is being finalized, the Sphinx reveals that Senlin is high on chrome and needs to get sober before they can go any further. Of course, Senlin takes offense to this, but it turns out the Sphinx is right. All this time, Senlin has been handling and gazing on the painting of Maria, which is infused with crumb. There's a lot to unpack there, but the important part is that the Sphinx insists that Senlin go looking for a book in his bottomless library and sends him off to do so with a bag of supplies and the librarian cat at his side, which is an obvious ploy to keep him away long enough to sober up. While Senlin is following the cat through the library in search of a book of zoetropes, the rest of his crew spend their days hanging out in an apartment provided by the Sphinx. They know that at some point he will insist on interviewing them, and when Byron finally comes to tell them that will happen, Adam is first in line, and Edith immediately uses her knowledge of the Sphinx's lair to help Adam escape. They were worried that the that the Sphinx might try to give Adam one of his um, modifications, so they board the last wall walker and ride it to the very top of the tower, where they are confronted by sparking men who somehow know all about Adam. Adam chooses to go off with them, and on the condition that they let Edith go. Meanwhile, we find out that Valletta has been spending her nights with the Sphinx. Not, not like, not like that, but like, like just <laughs> hanging out with. Early on, she realized she could leave her room through the vents, but immediately ran ran into the Sphinx. Wow. Okay, redo. <laughs> Early on, she realized she could leave her room through the vents, but immediately ran into the Sphinx by literally falling out of the ceiling. Thankfully, this meeting led to an odd sort of friendship through which it is revealed that behind the mask and under the cloak, the Sphinx is actually a very old woman who is pieced together with mechanical parts herself. So Byron then comes to collect Adam for his interview with the Sphinx, and it's immediately obvious that Edith helped him get away. She's marched off to answer for what she's done, only to have the Sphinx confide that she trusts Edith and wants Edith to be her right arm, as it were. It's funny, cause cause that's the missing arm. That's that's the arm that Edith doesn't have. This comes on the heels of Byron taking Edith on a little detour to show her that the red hand is a still alive. But in the end, Edith agrees to the Sphinx's new contract anyway and receives a new, much larger, stronger, and less pretty mechanical arm in return. While Edith is recovering from this procedure, Senlin finally comes to the end of his time at the library. He would eventually had to crawl on his hands and knees through a book tunnel, which originally sounded fun, but then started to sound scary. But all this happens as he follows the librarian cat in search of the Zootrope book. 
or zoetrope book. Not sure how to say that. And just when he is A, completely sober, huzzah, and B, thinks he's about to die as the book tunnel collapses around him, ooh, he spills out into a little bedroom where the Sphinx is waiting. Miraculously, the cat also delivers the zoo zoetrope <laughs> into Sedlin's hands. So it turns out that there's actually a giant zoetrope in the Sphinx's lair and that Ogier's sequence of paintings are installed in it. When all 64 of them have been returned, they will reveal the combination to the Bridge of Babel because as the Sphinx insists, the tower was never supposed to be just a tower, but a bridge to the heavens. Okay, deep breath. We know that's a lot to, to digest, but wait, there's more. Basically, a man who the Sphinx calls the bricklayer is the person who built the tower, and the girl in the painting is supposedly his granddaughter, hence the painting's name. The bricklayer got the tower as far as he could in his day, and the combination revealed in the zoetrope of paintings will open the vault that shows how it can be completed. As we know, unfortunately, Marat has five of the paintings, and the rest are supposedly still spread throughout the ringdoms. The Sphinx hasn't trusted the people in power for a long time, and for good reason, as we've seen so far. It doesn't help that her butterflies have been going missing in Pelphia, so she is assigning Senlin as her spy in that ringdom, with the express order that he tr that with the express order that he not try to contact his wife, Maria, who is supposedly living there. Arm of the Sphinx concludes with Senlin reuniting with his crew, with the exception of Adam, of course, and sharing one heck of a romantic moment with Edith. It makes things a bit awkward when the Sphinx announces that his reassignment to spy means that Edith is now captain of the new ship, the Sphinx's flagship called State of the Art, but he happily relinquishes his command and, of course, his crew agrees to follow Edith. Yeah, of course, the crew agrees to follow Edith. Sounds better. So our indomitable crew is splitting up at the Sphinx's behest. And as maddening as that is, considering the news her butterflies bring her at the very end of the book, it might be for the best. So lots happen. Holy shit. Holy, holy shit. I <laughs> What? And this is only book two, y'all. Oh, Lord. So, first of all, what the ever loving heck is Byron? I mean, I know what he was <laughs> an actual freaking deer, but how, why is he what he is? Like, we know like, the Sphinx is messing with machines and stuff, but wow. I like originally thought that the Sphinx was actually like a man who didn't had, like, I don't know, reconstructive deer surgery or something. <laughs> <laughs> but like, like, like that, the... like that real life person, that real life woman who tried to like have all this plastic surgery to make herself look like a cat. Like that mm -hmm. uh, actually happened. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Stick yeah. with makeup. If you want to look like a cat, let's stick with makeup. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. So like, there was the, uh, like it wasn't until there's like one specific section where he's like, I still remember having four legs, and I'm like, excuse me, sir, what? You are a real deer. But what I was, what I started to hypothesize is that like when the Sphinx is talking to Valletta, she like talks about how like she like you don't mess around in the brain because things can get a bit hairy, and I think like both the librarian and Byron have been intelligentified or rather or rather byron has been here you can communicate with humansified have english yeah. player. i don't cat. know the, the yeah. cat the librarian cat like while it seems you know to be more than a cat it also it still looks just like a regular cat and who it, knows what she did to the insides it doesn't Does talk it, or anything or at least doesn't talk to someone so did anyone here read the uplift war by david brim Mm -mm. No. That's all about basically raising up the intelligence of other animal species to so that they're like the equivalent intelligence of humanity. Um, so in this case, the Sphinx is uplifting these creatures pot potentially. Um, I don't know if that's where it's going, but that's how I interpreted what he did with the deer, or what, what, what and whether he did Byron or not. Is, and we find, later find out it's, it's a she. she. But, it's she. I know. It's so you know, weird. But it's it like, was a he at the time when I yeah. <laughs> at, the, at this part of the book. 
uh, it's he for so long and then it's she you know you get that big right. reveal <laughs> when, when she when she uh whether she uplifted byron and created byron and the cat or they were there before he she he then became she uh, ah. <laughs> just say they yeah they they, they the sphinx yeah they the sphinx um kate uh became the Sphinx themselves, that's still to be determined, right? I also do, I know this comes up later, but I think, I think the hypothesis, like the thing that was mentioned in the books where they were like, obviously the Sphinx wasn't only one person. Like that doesn't make any sense. It's been so much time, but I think it actually is. I very strongly suspect that Sphinx is one per Sphinx is one person, and I was thinking about this theory, and then I read Tara's notes, and I was like, holy shit, I actually do think this is it. I think she's a bricklayer's daughter granddaughter but yeah, yeah granddaughter yeah so granddaughter because that would give like in theory enough time for the bricklayer to like you know age out and like think about how much like like in terms of like time how much technology increases between like like across three generations like i feel and like also the fact that we know that the bricklayer lived to like 120 at least so like living that long is not out of the question and so like and that coupled with the fact the fact that she's just a floating triangle with no legs, <laughs> ma'am. Yeah, that's weird, ma'am. And I love how Valida calls the thing that she floats on her tea tray. <laughs> and then, and then straight up, she's sassy grandmother, the Sphinx, like sassy grandmother's Valida, and hands her an actual tea tray and is like, "Bitch, that's mm -hmm. what you asked for." <laughs> also, I like the Sphinx. Time, most of the whole time they were describing the Sphinx, all I could picture was like, like I could just picture my own grandmother as like her human parts. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, a small old lady with like gray hair. It's me, Grandma. Nick, did you say you do or do not like the Sphinx? Do I like her? Okay, a lot. okay, okay. I I figured that's what you said, but then I was like, wait, did I miss? You? I love her very much. If she turns out to be the ultimate big bad, I will feel betrayed, but I will also feel like proud of her for pulling that off and for making me trust her, like Valletta. Not saying that <laughs> Valletta climbing through the ceilings and greasing herself up with olive oil <laughs> is like kind of the move, but like, hey, girl, like maybe maybe just try the doors at some point. Because well, she can't Valetta though. Is a whole mood. She can't though because like they're uh, Ferdinand. That's he. Th that's yeah. the other. That's the other. The train. You know, monstrosity. The the giant clanking. Well, he's not train. a train. He's like a because he 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 walks. He yeah, I like it, it describes him as stomping. Right. Yeah, so, I always like assumed he was humanoid just because when they describe Henry like the Colossus, who like is holding the ship at the beginning, they describe Henry as like the Lord dude and then and then Ferdinand comes up and it's like one quarter Henry sized Lord dude and I was like ah yes I think no, I, I didn't have him as humanoid I had him no. much more as as sort of like a a, a train but on with feet yeah yeah or I had him as humanoid but with like the brain of a puppy I definitely yeah. had like puppy dog slash train in my head. <laughs> oh for sure he's like he is this weird it's like honestly it kind of reminds me of my my sister and brother-in-law's dog um he's this like some he's some sort of bully dog like not not an, not not a they're called like xl bullies i don't know it's some weird southern thing i think i don't think i this just is an really actual needed breed. you to know i really need you to know that for a second i thought you were gonna say yeah he just reminds me of my sister I'm like what? Yeah, my sister. Um, no, no, they 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 have this dog who they they like purchased ugh, to be a guard dog, and um, he's he's like almost three now, I think. But this dog is just he's basically like meant to be a guard dog, but he's really just a big, dumb, muscular ball of fun that just wants to like lick you, and that's oh, kind of what gosh. I picture Ferdinand as is like. Though. He's he's a machine, right? And he looks in my mm -hmm. mind, he looks like a big, just kind of squared off. Like he doesn't look humanoid, but he's supposed to be a guard dog, but he's got the brain of a of a very easily distracted puppy, you know. Yep. So it's kind of like, and he's okay, I, I, so I mean I love Ferdinand. It's, it's a new discussion point. 
Is Ferdinand a himbo? <laughs> I don't even know if you could say that. I don't that think so. I don't think he has enough of a brain. Can we use that yeah. term anymore? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Obviously. Who would ever know? Uses... I, I actually I was just that... about to use that term a day or two and, uh, ago and then thought better of it. The term, well, yeah. Jonathan, I'm yeah. glad that you question whether or not something is proper, but yes, that is an okay term. <laughs> yeah, the one that isn't good is bimbo. Mm. What? Bimbo isn't good, like B-I-M-B-O. Yeah. Himbo, H-I-M-B-O, is good because it's like, so like the whole- It's a male version of a bimbo, right? Exactly, but you could also use it for women because himbo is like considered like the loving, fun, dumb, good version of a bimbo, whereas bimbo was implied to be slut shamey and that's why it's bad. Mm -hmm. Therefore, himbo for a woman still has all the same qualities that himbo for a man does, which is imagine Thor just doing his Thor thing, but like Goral, which is allowed. But bimbo, you put the slut shaving back in it, so that's a heck no. Like Scorpia in uh, she yeah. run the Princess of Power is a great mm. example of a himbo yeah. who is oh, and I love using her. she, her pronouns. I would objectively say that menopausal Irene is also potentially a himbo. Yes. Especially yeah. with how she is like low-key adopting Valletta, but also being like, I'm not your mom, but also, hey kid, I love you. Also, poor Irene going through menopause like that. <laughs> I like broke my heart. She was like, I'm, th things are changing. And the Sphinx is just like, girl, you're going through menopause. Like, <laughs> like, it was such a quick moment, but I actually think that was my favorite thing because the idea it was so of good. This, yeah, like it was like this like buff, scary Amazon is going through menopause and she's like, what the fuck is happening to me? I'm losing my shit. And meanwhile, the ancient Sphinx is like, oh, girl, been there, done that. Don't worry, it's fine. Yep. <laughs> meanwhile, Valletta's just like, sweetie, you didn't know about menopause? Yeah. Well, I well, mean, had, had the who word is ever going to tell it, her? Loren was like, nah. <laughs> I think my favorite about that, though, is, like, you learn so much about, like, Irene's background with act without actually learning about Irene's mm -hmm. background, which is that she never had, like, any sort of female guidance that, like, in her life when she was old enough to be told about, like, her body, which is just really sad to think about because even Valletta had that. And, like, Valletta, like, basically leaves home at, like, what, 16, 15, 16? And so that's a little sad to think about it because, like, by that standard, like, Iran probably has not had, like, any sort of, like, female, like, m maternal figure or aunt-type figure since so she was, like, 13 or 14 or 12. Yeah. Or we just want to give her a, a little hug and squish her cheeks, even though she probably doesn't have chubby cheeks. But I feel like the sentiment still stands. <laughs> Yeah, you can always squeeze somebody's cheeks even if they don't have chubby cheeks. Yeah, I would have to probably stand on a table to reach your face, but like, eh, mm -hmm. I, think <laughs> I think that adds to the charm. Small. I mean, I might have to stand on a table to reach your cheeks. Yeah, I'm not sure. They, I mean, they're constantly calling her an Amazon. I don't think we ever learn exactly how tall she is, but she's very yeah. tall. <laughs> yeah, tall. she's clearly real, real big. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a really good, like, show don't tell, you know, mm -hmm. moment where you learn, like you said, so much about Iron's past without it just being plopped down right in front of you. And, you know, what I mean, it's it's just like, okay, well, I can obviously come to the conclusion that she hasn't had very many femme influences in her life and no, like, motherly, maternalish figures can't so, believe the Sphinx just became Irene's mom. Oh, Ooh, Lord. That's why the Sphinx doesn't try to recruit her. She's like, I can't believe I just gave this. this." Well, to her, everybody's a little girl because I stand by my she's hundreds of years old theory. So mm -hmm. so to her, Irene's probably like, we little bad. But she's like, I can't believe nobody has told this little girl about, about menopause. Yeah, I mean, it felt, you know, it feels like the menopause thing is a random aside in some ways, except for then you kind of, after the fact, you're like, oh, wait, no, this is like, again, just a way to learn a little bit more about her, about her 
backstory without it being just straight up written down on the page told to us. Yeah. Um, it the, also and also the fact like, that the Sphinx doesn't immediately, like you said, jump on bringing Iron into her fold, which is like counter to what Edith has been warning everybody about is very interesting because – you know, Irene is like, there's something wrong with me. And of course, the first thing she thinks is, well, the Sphinx will fix me, even though Edith has strictly told them, don't do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I also think it's like, it's really interesting because at first, like when you're, when like, whenever we got Irene's POV, I thought it was going to be like, I thought it was just going to ultimately be like, you know, she was getting old and therefore she was getting weak. And because she was getting weak, she was getting anxious. And that's what I thought it was just going to boil it down to. But the fact that it was menopause, like, first of all, it, like, kind of, like, more accurately cemented her age as well in my head. Because, like, mm -hmm. low-key, I was like, Iron could be anywhere from 40 to 70. And, like, I would be like, all right, yeah, sure. Especially with the silver hair. With the silver hair, you could have told me she was, like, 65. And I'd be like, all right, she's fit. Good for her. <laughs> also, like, I just... It, the whole Iren thing, like, really brought into, like, perspective, like, Edith's kind of, like, I want to say misunderstanding about the Sphinx, but also at the same time, like, the way that Edith's distrust of the Tower has, like, shaped her to interact with the Sphinx on that level. Because, to me, in a way, it seemed that, you know, wh while obviously, yes, the Sphinx is recruiting people, obviously, yes, the Sphinx is, like getting pe vulnerable people to sign contracts in exchange for something that they need. And she's like, you know, is obviously like very good at diplomacy and talking and like manipulation. It does seem that she like, based off of like Valletta's impression of her, that she genuinely does care about the tower and like not unclear if she cares about the people in the tower besides the tower can't fall and destroy everything and like it can't misuse its purpose but like i think it really like gives us more insight into edith's psyche and where she is because up mm. until now edith has seemed like very solid very sane like very much like fuck yeah edith you know what you're doing and now i'm just like oh no edith is just so scared like edith has just been so scared all this time and like even though like her whole character from senlin's perspective really seems to have her shit together like inside she's just as much of a mess as he is and like despite the fact that she has proved herself to like essentially like the the highest authority in the tower that she is capable of like being a good person despite doing bad things because like ultimately what the sphinx says is that the fact that edith betrayed her to save Adam, to save her friend, ultimately shows to the Sphinx that she is honest and loyal. And, like, that's, like, really hard to come by. And, like, Edith has, like, kept those qualities. Uh, I digress. I think Edith's neat. <laughs> I love Edith a lot. I well, wish to build a robot arm to go over my arm because I'm not saying that post breaking my elbow and having, you know, right arm surgery recovery conversations after dialogue in a book after having surgery on my right arm that I'm really loving and identifying with Mr. Edith Winters, but like, yes. I love well, her. Well, I mean, and honestly, like you said, you, you mentioned her her trying to kind of rescue Adam and make sure that the Sphinx doesn't get a hold of him. Um, and that kind of, I, that was something I really wanted to make sure we talked about, even though it's such a small part, right. In, in this whole third part of the book, it's, it's, it's such a very small part, but Edith doing that, you know, like you said, was what, what led the Sphinx to say, okay, well I can trust this person, but also Whoa, that whole thing where, you know, for, first, sure, the, the the last wall walker and everything, it, it's an interesting little aside, but the sparking men at also the top the of the town. totally fucked. Oh, yeah, ew. <laughs> like so like get it like, like get it girl I'm, but also ugh, he well, was no, so... i vibe with that so much like either either just being like i felt unattractive and he was there so and i was like yeah 
Yeah. I mean, yeah. listen, I ain't going to shame her for doing anything. Just like I said, get a girl, but also, ugh, he's gross. Also, no, Leah's ew. But Edith yeah. also admits that Leah's ew, and she's like, he was the only one there, unless I was going <laughs> to fuck the robot deer. She did not fuck the robot deer. <laughs> no, Byron would not allow. <laughs> You jumped across the wall walkers, but I thought it was weird that they had a stable for the wall walkers. Well, yeah, there used to be a whole ton of them. No, I know I, that. I, I, I understand why it would be like a garage, but why do you need it to look like a horse stable? I would imagine mechanical that mechanical machines. I don't get it. But. Oh my god! Oh my god! Do you think there were maybe like robot partial robot horses there at some point? Absolutely, one hundred percent. I wouldn't That's doubt why it. there was a stable. It used to have robot horses. Well, I also don't know the uh, safety deal with if they're leaking like fluids or, or oil or whatever. The straw would the stuff on the floor would certainly kind of be there to like soak it up. I again, straw yeah, soaking up any sort of motor oil is a bad idea in my mind. But you know, hey. I don't know. I don't know why, except for the fact that there must have been horses there. And considering Byron is a robot deer, why not robot horse? I would doubt. I I can't imagine there were totally real, like one hundred percent horses there because I just something don't... at least with the horse's head and digestive system that needed the the straw and the hay, or or just the expulsion of the digestive system. It needs it needs the straw to poop in. And well, I mean, and that's kind of where I'm thinking like about them, like the, the actual, the wall walkers, like leaking fluid or whatever. I mean, we're getting, we're probably getting way deeper into this than ever <laughs> needs to happen. But I just, you know, I just had a moment where I was like, was my hypothesis, the straw is there so the robots can poop. I mean, it's not, I mean, not actively, but like I said, you know. Oh, you know what? Screw, screw, screw the stable. There's actually a top to the tower because I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. Tara, we need you to uh, reach out to Josiah and find out about this whole stables thing. Also, I feel I'm like ready. we need to finish the series first and yeah, see that's if there's true. any sort of conclusion about why there was a full-on stable. Because, I mean, here's Listen, the thing. It could I'm also... not saying that there's going to be an entire chapter in book four detailing <laughs> the stables and the robot poop. Really isn't that cool. isn't that the extra um short story he's about to write to uh yes. yeah <laughs> well i mean and and here's the thing though like wh and why i i don't really think that there were any actual full on real horses there the whole tower is well at least starting in the baths you know it it's it's faking being like outdoors and uh and every, you know, you know what I mean. Like, like there's a sky, quote unquote. There's like it, it's it's all very. They want it outside of once you get outside of the basement and the parlor. You know, you're looking at places where they're trying to make it look. It's sort of like going to Disney World and going to Epcot, and you go into like the Mexico Pyramid or. Uh, I, that's the only one I can think of because I think the rest of them are, aren't really like this. But like you go inside the Mexico pyramid and the ceiling looks like a night sky, right? And it and the, the sides, like all the things on the sides, they look like buildings, even though you're inside a building, right? So that's kind of what I am picturing they do with the more important higher levels of the tower. And, and, and I think that that would include the stable you know, being there just as a, yeah, you know, hey, sure. Like, we just want it to look realistic, even though they're just machines. I mean, I get that for like the showy floors, but I don't know that I truly buy that in terms of like the Sphinx's place. Cause like, it seems that the Sphinx is more like function over form, but also the Sphinx has like multiple spaces dedicated to imitating each floor so who am i to say what the sphinx would do <laughs> i'm just talking about out my butt i need you know at least another 300 years of life experience and a triangle torso to, made of gold to tell you guys this and also a robot eye and also gray hair and also uh chest batteries 
I need chest batteries. Is that just a heart? Most of which you can buy at Walmart. That is <laughs> chest battery is a heart. <laughs> well, I no, I'm just like I'm like knee deep in a food coma right now. I swear I'm not insane. <laughs> Well, we keep digressing. Yeah, because you're off. never like this otherwise. <laughs> Calling me out like this. What, what is this? <laughs> well, we keep digressing back to the stables, but uh, <laughs> to go back to the, the original, plot. the original point before before we just digressed into this top of vibe, the stable vibe. That there's a top to the tower, right? Wow, holy crap! And uh, there's these perfectly blonde people that live up there or work up there or i'm not Are really you sure really what is the sparking man they're swedes yeah. <laughs> i mean yeah they're they're all very perfectly blonde for some reason and they live and or work at the top of the tower but you know listen it's like i can you know who cares what they look like i guess for now i imagine that's going to come back up later but it is it is very much it's touched on in a way that it's very culty. Bancroft's very culty. descriptions of people, like just you know, of Senlin, of Edith, of Volita and Adam, they've been, you know, basic. Um the color of hair, you know, maybe maybe a slight reference to skin color, but with this, he is very, you know, not overly descriptive, but he's very adamant in his description of them as being this set of lookalike, like perfect blonde people, which is- He goes very... out of his way to describe them to a point that like- Yeah. You saying perfect lookalikes makes me think like clones or clones. something along those lines. Yeah. And I'm just kind of like, are they all just like baby clones? Like, is that is that what's up? Also, I, God, sorry, it's another aside, but I was thinking about the top of the tower, the fact that like, everybody's like the silver trees at the, at the collar of heaven and i'm like and it turns out that they're just windmills mm -hmm. it's windmills kids windmills the answer also yeah no they're clones that's what i think i think they're clones but i why do they want adam there was a why do they know where, who adam is i mean they yeah. knew about him right they didn't know it edith was but they yeah, that was it also made me think that, like, with the end where you get, like, the sphinx and her butterflies and her spying with the butterflies, it made me think that the sparking men are also somehow under her control or, like, in her purview. And they know about Adam because she knows about Adam. And maybe this was always her real purpose for Adam, something to do with these sparking men. I don't know. All I need you to know is that like when the sparking men happened and like Adam was spared it away, I like looked through the rest of the book and I realized that Adam wasn't in it anymore. And I was like, fuck, I need to skip ahead to the next book and see what happens to Adam. And I'm like, don't do that, you idiot. Finish the book. <laughs> dumbass. <laughs> so one um one thing about this maybe being part of like Sphinx's plans for Adam is the Sphinx very clearly and I mean, maybe this is just her obfuscator or something, but she very clearly was like, I don't give a fuck about Adam. I got Valletta. That's who I really want. Yeah. And that was what it was ultimately. But it also makes me think that she did originally have a purpose for Adam because she because she does get to know Valletta before. And the Valletta that she gets to know, aka who Valletta actually is, is very different from the Valletta that you would have that she would have seen through spying. Mm -hmm. So it makes me think that like originally she had a different purpose for she had a purpose in mind for adam but then after meeting valetta she was like oh screw him i got the better kid i got the better better sibling i got the bird mm -hmm. i think valetta's neat too can we talk about how she Valetta's just shaved so her hair off to go spying and to like save edith and Zenlin? like like what a boss like go valetta i didn't God, that was the last episode like nami God, no, you're so last episode. <laughs> <laughs> was you were here though, so I, I I will allow that. I will I will allow it. <laughs> that was last episode. Yeah, no, basically this whole book was me just going like every single time Valletta did something, I was like, you reckless baby child. And then also at the same time, I was like, oh, that was like really ballsy of you for trying to save them and like for trying to protect mm -hmm. your people. Like, you care. 
And then and then she also does something, and I'm like, girl, why are you like greasing yourself up like a pig and corn <laughs> sliding the fence? <laughs> well, before, before we totally move on to Classic Lolita. Valetta. Yeah, I, I don't know. I call her Valita, so sorry. We're gonna be we're gonna be in the I'm audiobook gonna... calls her Valetta. Okay, well, I'm gonna call her Valita because I don't care about the audiobook. Okay. Wow, <laughs> Kara. Wow. I listened to half of this book in audiobook, so Nick, I am half Queen Valetta. You're half on my side and half on. <laughs> well, see, I can see whose side I on. I'm on because unlike Genya. I mispronounce Valida's name every single time. And like Genya, I at least have stayed like solidly Genya. I will never say Genya. Please shoot me. It's a <laughs> hard G. I stand by it. <laughs> that is the hill I will die on. <laughs> but it is a gift. <laughs> yeah, like for Valida, I just, I just, I don't know. I can't even remember which version I said last time. <laughs> and last time was four seconds ago. <laughs> um, yeah. I, so, so anyway, before I move completely on to Valida, uh, I did just the I I get that the butterflies could have something to do with them knowing about Adam, but in that case, that means that the Sphinx is feeding them very specific information. But also, they seem to know like what his future is, which means that the Sphinx is involved. Like you said, she had a not only did she have a plan for Adam, but she told it to the sparking men. I don't know. It, it's still, I, I know that there's a very good chance that that's what it is, but it still felt like for the first time in, th in these books that this was something that felt otherworldly in a way like fantastical, right? You know, it wasn't, it wasn't something. It, obviously, there as as we're moving up through the tower and learning more about these places. It, obviously, it's a fantasy world, but every bit of it seems to be, other than the tower itself, just existing, uh, seems to be like based in some sort of technology or whatever. And this is the first time that I felt like, whoa. Other, other than the, this part, this the part three of Arm of the Sphinx, that this and the librarian cat. It's like I can even set aside Byron because you know he was a deer that was completely modified so that he can move and talk like a human but then there you know there's the cat who is like ha pseudo seems magical librarian cat and then there's even on top of that the sparking men who seem to know very specific sort of tunnel vision things about the future and that's that was very it 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 felt not in line honestly with the rest of with with Senlina Sens and the whole first part of this book and the rest of this book and I'm not, it, not in a bad way. I just mean that it has, it piqued my curiosity in this maddening, like, will we ever see them again way, you know? I think for me, so there is one thing that I do know. So I had read like reviews of the next book and all I read in the review was that they were like, why does this book start with 200 pages of Adam? I don't give a fuck about Adam. And I was like, ooh, next book starts with 200 pages of Adam. I guess we're going to find out what's up with the sparking men. So that's what I heard. Oh, sorry, sorry. Book four. Book four. I was going to say, A, spoiler alert. B, because <laughs> <laughs> wow. I haven't read the fourth book yet. But so apparently book four starts with Adam. So I was like, I don't know when it's going to happen, but we're going to get Adam answers. So like, I'm very excited to find out what happens. But I think the thing that this tower, like this story has done so well is that everything the environment is so wrapped up in like this biblical steampunk like cover that it's very easy to miss like anything that could be vaguely magical about it because it's so technology driven and i think for me that's the same thing that happened with the sparking men like the sparking men were so obviously like technology like cultish weirdness that I was like ah yes there must be some further technology answer to this but like it was weird because like the questions they were asking Adam the very my very first knee-jerk thing was that oh maybe Adam's father came to the tower and I'm like actually wait no Adam's father is dead and I'm like wait actually but the tower is called the bridge to heaven is it like communication of the afterlife and then I went all like this weird like rabbit hole and then I went on another rabbit hole because I found out that the author has pet rabbits and 
then <laughs> I digress. This is shocking, Nami. <laughs> you would go on different tangents. <laughs> Who would have thought? Me? Tangents? No, never. That's way more of a Jonathan kind of thing than you. Oh, obviously. Nami, concise. Yeah. Jonathan. That's a term, I would even say. <laughs> Jonathan. Wordy. Nami, to the point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop now. Somebody else talk. I'm going to drink water. Uh, okay, so, you know, I, I and again, I figured we would get Adam and the Sparking Men again. Um, good to, I, I mean, and I had read the third book, so I did know that it would eventually happen, but not necessarily then. <laughs> I can't, wait to edit, I can't wait to edit this because I'm so cutting all of this out of the podcast so that, good, good. you know. Oh, uh, except that I have to do more work. Thanks, Nami. <laughs> okay. So yes, we will get them eventually. I still think it's weird that they knew all about Adam and actually even had an idea of what his future would be. And uh, you know, but also didn't know Edith at all. And unless we're gonna like just off her because she wasn't part of the story. Yeah, that you was know? so weird. Yeah, it was also like weird because they were specifically like, you're not part of this part. And I was like, that's a weird specification to make. Like this part? I don't know. I like stuck on that a lot. And I was just kind of like, I don't know what's up. And then I was also like, why are y'all about to murder her? What if she's in a different story, assholes? Stop doing murder. Also begs the question, how did that one guy who's a... Uh diary adam had get up there steal gold apparently and get back but you know <laughs> maybe we'll find out about that later too <laughs> honestly maybe. adam just be like trying to pry up gold from the floor with his fingernails i was like sweetie sweetie this isn't gonna work like i get that you want the gold but it's not happening so anyway we had gone on to uh, we had sort of almost, almost like veered off into Valida, but thankfully I brought the conversation back to Adam. <laughs> Such a good jump. To her. <laughs> and, let's, and, let's ju and let's jump to the drug abuse. Let's what, Jonathan? Jump to the drug abuse. Yeah. Oh no, yeah, we'll leave that for the very end because I mean, all the stuff with Semlin happens at the very end. But yep. Valida and the Sphinx uh, being friends, I was both surprised and not. I did like the this quote a lot because it's not just about them. It's also kind of realistic. Uh, some friendships develop like flowers in a garden. They are conscientiously planted and nurtured. They, the ground about them is kept clear of competition. Then after some weeks or months of incremental growth and laborious uh, pruning, a flower broom. Bleh, wow, I can talk. Then, after some weeks and months of incremental growth and laborious pruning, a flower blooms. Such cultivated friendships are agreeable and convenient, if not enduring. Other friendships seem to arise spontaneously, like an egg in a nest or a freckle upon an arm, and these are often mystifying, as both parties are left to wonder how exactly this unexpected affection took hold. So, the Sphinx doesn't that. put... Tr it's uh, Yeah, it's really nice. And... It also makes me think about how my physical therapist and I have accidentally become friends. Right? I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, as I, you know, it's like, okay, so they became friends, whatever. But then that passage happens and it's like, it got me thinking like, ah, some of my closest, longest friends were the, like, I don't, I don't have any friends, like close, long-term friends who I would categorize in the former, you know, that, that you... I, I, I mean, I have friends who I met through like meetup groups and stuff and sure they were, they were fine friendships, whatever, but they haven't lasted. Mm -hmm. And the, the ones that did were the ones where I met people totally by happenstance and it's just like, we might not like we have, we have geek things in common maybe, but we're totally different people, but also I'm in love with you. Yay. And I mean that in a friendship way, you know, cause you can be in love with your friends, I think anyway, Absolutely. but, uh, but you know, the Sphinx, the, I think the thing here is that the Sphinx, as she 
straight up says to Edith later, doesn't put trust in others easily, easily, but she actually lets Volita see her biggest weakness very quick, like very early on in their friendship that she's powered by the same batteries as, or, or well, first of all, that she's a woman and that she's floating on a tea tray and mostly <laughs> mechanical, uh, you know, but then a little while into it, she's, she, she, shows Valida that she's powered by the same batteries as her the parts of her Wakeman, as Edith's arm, as whatever the fuck is going on with the red hand. And she even asks Valida to change her battery. And in doing so, she puts her life in Valida's hands for that moment. And it's it, th that's a lot to unpack, honestly. Yeah. The, a lot. The skeptic in me was like, did she have a backup battery? Was right. it all like a ploy to like judge Valida and to like see her trustworthiness or like the other half of me or was like, is it just like, is this just like a very lonely old woman just finding a kindred soul? Because I, I don't know. I feel like something about the way that like Valida and this, ow, fuck. I tried to, don't mind me. I tried to like push myself up on the elbow right after PT did not work painful zero out of 10 but a part of me just wondered if like the sphinx it seemed to me like the sphinx was seeing a kindred spirit in Valida, and i think to me like the way that their whole interaction kind of seemed to build was the sphinx just being like ha look at this silly child and then being like oh no i love this silly child it me and that was like the vibe I got. But at the same time, if it turned out to be a whole manipulation and she just had a second backup battery, I'd be like, yup, that tracks. But also if it turned out to not be a manipulation and she was just like, I'm tired and this girl and this child, this, this new, this tiny girl is my new friend and please help. I tired. I would accept both answers. I don't think I've ever been so ready to be like, this person could be evil or good and I would be happy, but I am. <laughs> That's where I'm at. Go Sphinx. We're team Sphinx. Sphinx now. Sphinx? Sphinx. <laughs> I'm good okay, the it. funny thing is, this is a totally random aside, but give me a second for it. There is a gas station uh, that was founded in the Greenville area and it's Sphinx, like it's a chain of gas stations called Sphinx, and their their uh, mascot is a tiger-looking. What I'm guessing is supposed to be a the sphinx. face, at least, of a sphinx. But I, I, for the longest time, I was like, did they just like misspell it on their registration papers, like their business registration papers, and just go with it? Because it wouldn't be the first time I'd seen something like that. When I lived in Virginia, there was a trailer park where I lived that was called Locust Gardens, and the sign had lotus flowers on it. So, you know, I was thinking that's what it was. But no, apparently the guy who actually like create, like founded the gas station chain, is, his last name was Sphinx, which is a weird last name. I don't, like, like that, that okay but yeah so anyway every time i like read sphinx i'm like mm, sphinx. <laughs> sphinx. <laughs> anyway yeah, so no, that's I my random aside sometimes <laughs> it's kind of funny that i'm on a talkie thingy when sometimes that word's bad uh but anyway so <laughs> I, I digress so much i don't even remember where i was <laughs> uh sphinx good sphinx evil love sphinx I, you know, I think that the Sphinx is, I think that the Sphinx is, I, I would not say that she is good. Yeah. I also would not say at this point, my opinion could certainly be swayed that she is evil. Mm -hmm. I think that she has a one track mind and that one track mind is, you know, save the cheerleader, save the world. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Ah, thank you. A quote I have not heard in a long time. <laughs> save the tower, you know, save the world, right? I saw a picture of Mila Ventimiglia recently, and I was like, that's nice. I still have a crush on you. <laughs> oh, I have a crush on him from Gilmore Girl days. Oh, man. Did you, you, still, you still want Rory with him, right? Oh, for sure. Random aside <laughs> again. But, uh, but yeah, so, so I, 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 I feel agree. like... I, the Sphinx's motivations are so, like, 
one track focused on finishing the bridge of Babel that it's like very difficult to judge where she stands on base morality around everyone because it seems that her morality to her doesn't matter because she cares so much about this goal. Yeah, I I, I think I that <laughs> I think uh, that I don't, go go ahead, Jonathan. Someone I, I would have I would have thought of her as lawful evil. In oh the, my god speaking of lawful oh no i'm not going to digress never mind in the, in the, yeah her goals are her own and they're not they're they're not good goals but lawful she has a, but she has a code to get there to a certain degree but her goals aren't necessarily evil but they leave i think her the, i the think her may main, not be evil but the the result of the goals are evil or maybe not the result but the way she's getting there right like the the goal may not be evil and you know it, i i think but here's the thing though like we've only the only wakeman we've really met so far are the red hand who clearly went off as rocker and that was not entirely like that was nothing that the sphinx told you, you know what I mean? That, that it's the Sphinx's fault in that she created him, I suppose, but it's not the Sphinx's fault in that she led him to do this, as far as I can tell. And then we've got Edith, who is clearly just mad at the world uh, for good reason, of course. And, but part of that, you know, world very specifically is the Sphinx for, you know, as she says, coercing, coercing her into the contract to save her life in a way and then we've got marat who whatever the fuck happened with him however the hell he started and became a wakeman you know he yeah sure he's against the sinks but he's also kind of i think so it's like the only, the only the only good yeah, he, character he, i mean if, if you take him for for at face value In that he's trying leading the Hod revolution because of how he felt the Hods were treated, right? I mean, now he has ulterior motives using that to go to do something else that we don't know yet. But I'm just going to say, but the Sphinx was allowing the Hod, the abuse of the Hods, et cetera, et cetera. So I can't say that would be necessarily a true. good person. I mean, if she had wanted to, if only there were some. Them. If only there was some area between good and evil. <laughs> I think neutral? that's what I'm classifying <laughs> her specifically as lawful neutral because to me, like at least like if you think about this purely in terms of D and D classifications, lawful good is somebody who always does the good thing because it's the good thing to do. Lawful evil or chaotic evil or the evil spectrum is somebody who knows that they are doing evil and continues to do evil because that's what they want to do. Neutral, I think, is somebody who very mm -hmm. much is making choices for just the choices sake and they are willing to go with whatever the result is. And I think that's the difference between like the neutral alignment and the good and evil alignment because the good and evil alignment in my mind, they're the ones that are looking at the results and saying, I am doing this action based off of this result. And the result is good, therefore they're good. Or the result is bad, therefore they're bad. But I think neutral, the reason they are neutral is that they're doing the action for the action. Um, although I would say, like, I do believe that the Sphinx is neutral, lawful neutral right now. But I also very much believe that Marat is lawful evil because there is a very specific type of evil person that manipulates the helpless in order to further his cause. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that him saying that he's like freeing the Hods and the next book is called the Hod King. And I can't help but suspect that that's what Marat is calling himself. And then the next yep. book is called Marat. But anybody who, and clearly he's not just saving the Hods and letting them make that choice because as Valetta sees, they clearly murder that one Hod who doesn't want to join. And if that is truly what was happening, there would be an option there that wasn't murder. An option like, you know, hold them in a comfortable prison because you can't let the secret out. 
but they go straight to murder. That's not good. And then on top of that, you know, whatever he says to Sendlin and Edith cannot be trusted, like at face value, mm-hmm. cannot. And I frankly trust Valletta's perspective of being like, why the fuck are these idiots walking right into this? This is clearly a sketchy ass place. The fact I, I just inherently distrust anybody who um, destroys books and destroys sources of learning. That's almost mm-hmm. always synonymous with bad. And then on top <laughs> of that, add to the fa- fact that he is clearly using as his sort of bait, as his hook, as his motivation to co- coerce and convince people into believing in his cause as him lifting up the unliftable when you see what he's actually doing is using them to further his agenda i am convinced that he is the most evilist i'm convinced that he is the big bad i don't know if he's yeah. the big bad but he is definitely evil yeah yeah he, yeah, he is not a good person I, yeah, uh, I think at this point it's really hard to say who the big bad is because I still feel like there's something else that we oh for sure I agree seeing. I agree yeah. with the picture that we have right now right um, yeah is really bad. isn't Sedlin the big bad we yeah. don't have the whole picture <laughs> Sedlin's just I, like, I would listen. buy into that I would buy into Sedlin stumbling into becoming the big bad I don't Ooh. think he's deliberately making that choice Ooh. but if you if Josiah Bancroft like set that up i would totally be like that was a great play yeah i don't <laughs> think he is though i i think he's i don't just think bored. he is either but like i i could see it he's just stumbling he it, i would i would agree yeah no yeah. i think i think marat just seeing everything with marat and like i knew the next book was called hod king and initially i was so excited i was like yay the hod king he's gonna come save everybody and free the slaves and then i saw him and i'm like oh now i'm just real fucking pissed because like there's a specific type of yep. trash that takes advantage of the helpless and the enslaved in order to further their cause, and that is the exact type of garbage yep. that he is. Doesn't matter that he's sitting on his wheelchair pretending to be paragon of good. I see him for what he is, garbage boy. <laughs> but also, can we talk about the fact that I mean, like he, he kind of is garbage boy because his legs are literally garbage. They're just <laughs> useless. <laughs> I was gonna address his legs, but not in that way. I was gonna address the well, fact that he has casual. turned his magical legs into trash. Wow. My actual intention was to address the casual disability and just to be like, oh yeah, just like the fact that like it, it never really like struck me until you see Marat in his wheelchair, but like we just have like casually disabled people like in our main cast, like because with Adam, he's got one eye with Edith, even though she has, you know, effectively a prosthetic, she still is an amputee. And just the fact that like up until now, I hadn't noticed it. And then there was a wheelchair and I was like, wheelchair. And then I was like, oh, damn it, he's evil. <laughs> I mean, I, I also not. like we. you can make the argument that Valida uh, for sure is uh not physically disabled but oh no she's like super adhd yeah yeah the most ADHD. ADHD. the adhs to ever d the adhd is strong in this one y'all <laughs> the one adhd to rule them all yeah oh, the one ADHD to bring them all and in the darkness not bind them because <laughs> they can't sit still also uh, i don't think anybody could bind Volita. No, absolutely not. Well, Rodian sure as hell tried, but that was oh gosh, ugh. Ugh, Rodian, nobody, nobody can guide Valida. She frees squirrel, flying squirrels, and then and then climbs through oh. piano trees to save them. I love and Aren murders people because they <laughs> try to give <laughs> Valida shit. Let my daughter steal squirrels, damn it! So we all. Uh, we all we touched on the fact that the Sphinx is a she several times, but wow, the Sphinx is a she. So before we no, move on to other things, because there, there are other things I, I want to talk about. I, I did want to hear everyone's first impressions of and, and we're gonna go in order here. Okay, so I'm gonna start, then we'll go to John, then Nami, then Nick. Uh so the first time I read this, like learning that the Sphinx was a woman, it's like she is didn't expect it but in the end when i look back 
And and of course, I, I I do also believe that she wasn't the original Sphinx. I I think that this is a title that was inherited. I I do believe that she is the bricklayer's granddaughter, and and this is literally pure just kind of intelligent conjecture on my part. This is not me knowing. I have not read ahead enough to know anything like that. But that is my you know conjecture. So it was it was shocking at first but then it was like yeah of course she is so john i don't know for, first impressions of finding of, of the sphinx removing her spoon her spoon disguise and finding out that she is a woman well the only reason i was surprised is cuz they had always been referred to as he the entire time mm. so i mean in in a vacuum finding out a character as male or female wouldn't have surprised me at all, except for the fact that the author referred to in everything, in everything you had heard about the character, it was referred to as a male. Well, everybody, th I mean, everybody, everybody in the tower thinks that the Sphinx. Right, but even the people who had met, met the Sphinx said, I mean, Edith had met the Sphinx and said mm -hmm. he. Well, so, right, because she never yeah, did but her Edith didn't know that it was a woman. Edith but, she also, but he also didn't know that it was a he. I mean, because he was in the disguise, you didn't know if it was he or she, but he was referred to as a he. So I think this refer. I think this brings up a very important point at the implicate mm -hmm. um, assumption of people to think that a person in power is male mm -hmm. if yeah. not specified or not gendered, or to also assume that somebody, when not gendered explicitly, is male, especially if they're in a person of in a position of power. Yeah. Yep. I think that's definitely a big part of it. I think that's you know. one of the reasons it was so effective too. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of the reasons, like even though upon rereading, upon retrospect, it's obvious that of course the Sphinx, the Sphinx could be a woman. Wow, I will never say Sphinx correctly, apparently. Oh wait, never mind. just did. But <laughs> I, I think like that whole thing works so well, especially because with the voice modulation, while obviously on the base level, it's for anonymity. The other thing is that it is for authority because people will respect a male voice more than a frail female voice. It just is. I will say though, my first impression was absolute hilarity because I was I was still very much fixated on Edith being like she like the sphinx looks like a spoon okay and to Iren because Iren was just like I, I I like how it was just like Edith knew what Iren was asking and instead she decided to scream fuck you and say the sphinx looks like a spoon and then I wasn't expecting that to pan out and it actually did and I was like all right spoon Edith you win good job <laughs> Also, I gotta say, I will. I would love to see this become like a movie series or a TV show or something. Yeah, that would be so see cool. how they portray the Sphinx as a spoon. <laughs> well, I think I think the spoon was like because it's a concave mirror, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's like it's like I don't have. I was gonna pick up a spoon and hold it in front of my face, but I do not have a spoon to hold in front of my face. Yeah, apparently you don't have a spoon in your room. Well. Uh, I have a plastic spoon in the trash can, but I don't want to dig in the trash can. <laughs> That's fair. That's very fair. And so my plan, though, was for comedic effect to hold the spoon really close to the to the camera, so the spoon would look big and cover my face, so then I would be like, "Ooh, uh -huh. me, the Sphinx." And then you're that. like, "I'm, I am the Sphinx." <laughs> we'll okay, so it's, fine. it's fine. But yeah, um, so my yeah. first impression at the actual reveal. I'm sorry. I, 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 okay. I, I was digressing about the spoon, but I also was like, oh, it's so obvious that of course she was a woman this whole time. Who else has the patience to do this shit? A man would to be too busy doing war. And I stand by that generalization. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was, that was my knee jerk reaction. And also I was like, oh, of course she just bonded with Valletta so quickly. Like, and that was another thing that like, like cemented my like kindred souls with like Sphinx and Valletta storyline thing theory that i have going there but yeah that's that's what i thought usually usually if it's like an older woman and like a younger and like a young woman i'd be like oh yes she's adopted her and i'm like no she's not adopted her like she specifically has it she's like oh no it's young me mm -hmm. yeah so nick what about you first impressions um i would say kind of similar to nami like uh in hindsight yeah, it makes total sense. Uh, I, it is always, it always does take a minute when, you know, somebody has been gendered one way to mm -hmm. kind of go, oh, 
that's not that's not their gender okay that's fine uh but i think overall it was just like oh that actually makes a lot of sense and move on from there yeah okay so there's a bunch of stuff we want to like i i want to touch on but before i get into that lol about Semlin sniffing his Maria portrait and oh getting God. lost from it. I literally could not even, because the whole beginning of this book, I was like, dude, why the actual fuck are you still hallucinating? Like, speaking of like metabolism and overdose times and all of this stuff, mm -hmm. you should have really gotten this out of your system by now. Why are you still hallucinating? Did you just have a psychic break? I thought he had a psychic break. Mm -hmm. It was a really clever and like scientific explanation too, that the, um, the, the painting was coated with crumb and also something about it getting wet. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so no, it, it was, like it bonded the crumb. Right. Paint. Right. So poor Sunderland ain't ever getting his painting back as far as we know, but yeah. For the best, he was literally huffing a painting. I don't think he deserves to have it back. He was like, "I'm trying to do. I have like something around here. Here's 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 my here's my art that my dogs chewed from the. No. Oh yeah, my dogs got a hold of this somehow. They don't no. ever chew things, and I don't know how this happened. It was when I was on vacation one time, but this is like this is Semlin with his Maria painting, yeah. just like, oh Maria, I miss you so much. I miss you so much." <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Meanwhile, this is my mouth. He's just meanwhile, getting high Edith. as hell. Meanwhile, Edith, we'll talk about that in a hot minute. But th th his whole time in the library, you know, is just, I, I know that it's, he's literally being sent there to clean up, right? I mean, that's kind of odd. I mean, th mm -hmm. it's obvious. Like the Sphinx, the Sphinx doesn't say it, it's never said out loud. But of course, that's what is happening. I'm going to give you this like impossible to find book in this impossible library with this cat as your guide. Don't eat the cat food, by the way. And, you know, it, it, he, he just goes through the library. Oh, there's a, that, that, that there's that one moment that one time where he almost gets caught in one of the traps. Yeah, and he survives because it's like it's like a disc on a stick, and there's a skeleton on the stick disc, and he pushes the skeleton to the other side, and he jumps off, and the skeleton gets yeeted into the ditch, and he's like, "Thanks, bud." That whole thing was like, why are there traps in the library? I don't this know, but I like it. Really letting people in there who she wants in there. Why are there traps in the library? Well, well, I was was it, are we sure it was a real trap, mm. or was mm -hmm. he still high and in withdrawal at that point? Oh, I think it was a real trap. I think, I think it was a real trap. The I Sphinx even also, says that the library has there, he said traps. there are traps there, but then I wondered was there did, was well and even even really like bad. after that happens when Semlin is has been, you know, days and days and days removed and has is clearly going has gone through enough withdrawal where he's not going to be having hallucinations anymore. He still hears the crying and stuff like that, and and he's like, nope, not being you know fooled by that again. So I yeah, I think they were legitimate traps. I don't really understand why, unless the Sphinx has had, unless unless people have gone in there that who weren't supposed to, because he's like again, he's he's warned about these things. It's not like they send him in there blind. They're like, beware of the traps. Don't eat the cat food. Also, I think it was never, really you know, funny that Byron gave him chocolate and Sendlin literally eats it on the third day and <laughs> writes himself an apology, bro. He's like, I'm sorry hey. if you just knew the chocolate was real good. Worst part about this was that I was eating one of my last, like, lip truffles at the time, and I just looked at it and I was like, shit. I mean, well, honestly, well, I, if it was me, I would have eaten days. shit. I would've, it would have been gone after the first day for me. <laughs> same, same. <laughs> Like, this is the only I mean, chocolate I have. I know I should make it last, but I'm going to eat it Speaking now. Speaking of which, I should go get some chocolate. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I would have I would have saved it for my exit reward. I'm glad that you have that much self. You have stronger willpower than the yes. rest of us. 
I also don't really have a sweet tooth. That's the thing. Unless I was uh, PMSing, the chocolate would be safe. <laughs> if I, I was have PMSing, a big sweet yeah. tooth, but I do have I do have enough of one where even if I knew, I think maybe especially if I knew that that was my only chocolate, I'd be like, mm, eat this immediately. I think my, my bigger concern would have just been like YOLO eating all the crackers because I am a when bored snack when doing physical exertion snack mm. and walking through a giant library means snack. Alternatively, yep. I would have sat down in bread and fallen asleep there. Alternatively, I would have been distracted by all the books. And I can't believe Senlin as a teacher. I think the only reason he wasn't was because he was going through withdrawal and he was like, just get me out of here. And also, like, you know, he he didn't want to leave his his fam alone. Also, there lost. was specifically like sections where he was talking about how he would go into like when he entered a room, he would like just like pick up a book and be like, why no reading while walking. And I was like, sir, how are you not bouncing off walls? There's also one specific part where he's like, where he was like, I have the constitution to be able to read on trains and in carriages. And I was like, I can't read in cars. That's not that's not fair. Oh, I can. I've I, I think that no. would have been the end of me like literally my entire life if I couldn't read while I was traveling like in cars and stuff because that's all I, I did. <laughs> I can't read in planes. I can't read in cars. Like the the car motion. Oh, we took it's so many road sense, trips. Headaches. We took so many road trips when I was a kid that I think I I I don't know what I would have done if I couldn't have read in a car. I played honestly. video games or I stared out of the window I and didn't have, out of it. I didn't have that option. <laughs> I'm old. Didn't you play license yeah. plate? Baby Nami has access to video games. The rest of us didn't. I stuck my head out of the car window like a little dog. Uh, you, you, we, you didn't play license plate? I mean, we played those sometimes, but I didn't. I, I didn't care about those. I just wanted to read my books, man. License plate? What the fuck is license plate? Yeah, when like you're where, to count where you... how many states license plates yeah. you see on your trip. I played the one where you okay. can tell punch, where you can tell that, that was the thing. <laughs> so suspicious. We're all learning. Yeah, we're all learning so much about each the other. Seventies, the seventies were pathetic. Okay, we didn't... no, we still did that in the eighties and nineties, and honestly, two thousands. I'm pretty sure the last time I played that game was one of the last times I went on a road trip with my sisters, which was probably two thousand two or something. So, uh, okay. So back back to back to Senlin in the library. Puerto Rico was always a good one to see. I have never seen a Puerto Rican <laughs> license plate. So I almost spit my water on my laptop, John. How did they get that car here? That was probably <laughs> how did you get that car here? It was I mean, I know how, like literally how, but like that's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> but how? Okay, so Senlin. <laughs> Senlin, back to Senlin, who has, they don't have license plates in this, in this world. That we know of. That we know, that we of. know true, of, true, true. We haven't heard anything about cars, though. So, uh, okay, so so before I move on to other things that I really want to talk about, that I'm itching to talk about, any 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 last thoughts on Senlin in the library and him finding, it, well, the librarian finding his zoetrope book and how he's, I, I don't know, any last thoughts about that whole shtick? At first, when he was crawling through the tunnel of books, I was like, oh, this seems really nice. And then he got crushed by them. And I'm like, oh, this is less nice. <laughs> I yeah. feel like that would be dangerous. Yeah. But like, tunnel of books! So Amazing. I'm, I'm uh, a little bit claustrophobic. Ah, uh, okay. I'm not. That, so. Yeah, that explains it. Yeah. No wonder I vibed with that, whereas most people don't. I was like, this sounds like heaven. Give me small and close space. I can't even people. stand the closeness of people crammed into Dragon Con elevators. So, like, cannot stand it. That's why I, at all costs, avoid going anywhere in the Marriott that involves an elevator. If I this can help it. This is really funny to hear, but I, like, spiritually would love to be just, like, a sardine in a can. Sounds real cozy. I mean, no. <laughs> it's, not, it, it's not even the closeness of people. It's no. the small space and also too many people. So, but okay. yeah, okay. yeah that, 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 that whole passage of him crawling through the, the, the I, I literally had to tell myself, don't imagine him actually doing this. Don't imagine him actually doing this. Mm. 
Just picture, me, picture, picture that he's still in a library. It's just not as big as the one he was in before or something. <laughs> Don't imagine him actually crawling through a small tunnel. I, books. I think for me, I just, I feel very secure in small places. And like, I spent half of Dragon Con drunkenly sitting under tables because it felt safer. So like, I think I vibe very differently with that scene. <laughs> I can see being under a table being safer than out it's in the press of the crowd. I, I, yeah, exactly, because you're protected. I don't know. But anyway, so I, I, anybody else have thoughts about Senlin's time in the library? Or I, honestly, really... I want a his, library. His, 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 the, the, the reveals at the end of it, this zoetrope that this giant zoetrope where all once all the paintings are inserted, it will have a combination to the secret. I mean, that's a huge reveal. It's huge. It's huge. It's huge. It's huge. So Senlin is sober. His time in the library is over. Rhyme not intended. Uh, he is now seen. He's he's been told about the bricklayer, and he has seen the giant zoetrope. And we know that Marat has five paintings. I think it's. I think it was. And now Senlin has returned the bath, the painting from the baths. So the uh, the and Sphinx has twenty something. The Sphinx is missing twenty something paintings. Yeah. So there's sixty four. We know that five of them are with Marat and. Uh, you, we ha I have to imagine that even if Marat doesn't know about the zoetrope, I don't know. I feel like he has to, right? Why I don't know if he knows about the zoetrope, but I think that the paintings are now like sort of like status symbols within the tower. Because I think people who are in the tower know that every like layer of the tower's ruling person had one. And I think that would be a sort of thing that would pass into Tower Legend for people who are in the know. And I think Marat strikes me as somebody who'd be in the know on that level. And I don't think anybody else knows about the Zotrope. I think they're just like, this is the status symbol that I need if I ever want to be able to talk. Like, if I ever want yeah. to be able to get, like... Because, like, the Sphinx was saying, like, this is, like, the status symbol that people had if they wanted to be able to, like, get, like, the bricklayer's ear, essentially. And I think that meaning behind the paintings has been like handed down through the generations but like the purpose of the paintings is being like we are an alliance of 64 has been lost clearly but i think for me that reveal was less shocking in the sense that it was what it was more than the fact that like because like i i expected some sort of reveal about the painting to occur and the fact that they are are 64 just almost identical the first thing i thought of was like when like when when i would take like the stacks of post-its and like write little stick figure animation doodles on the bottom and flip through them that was the first thing i thought of the second thing i thought was wow i'm a zootrope maker the third thing i thought was this makes a lot more sense than whatever my idea was because my idea was just a giant question mark and going magic painting and that was all i had um, the fact that the tower is a bridge instead of a tower, very, very curious about that. Very interesting in seeing, like, is is this going to end like a trigger anime and they're just going to go to space? Is that is that what the ending of the Tower of Babel series is? Because, like, if so, okay. You know, there's a reason Trigger has done it in multiple animes. It works. <laughs> but also at the same time, I was just kind of like, I know so little about this and this just seems like a crack open of the door to the future plot that like I can't even begin to like think about what this could mean except for the fact that I was like I knew there was going to be something with the paintings now we have it also what the fuck <laughs> not a read more. also what the fuck speaking think, of also I, what the fuck I oh, think that Marat definitely knows about the um oh god I'm blanking now on the name of the, 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 oh, no, the, the zoetrope the zoetrope. the zoetrope thank you um because the sphinx let Senlin in on it pretty quickly and what if he's not if she's never told anyone before why would she be letting Senlin in on it now Fair. So I think that there must have been some shared knowledge of the Zotrope. It's not like she was keeping it secret for him. So 
and and if if you if all of a sudden she's decided, oh, this is the guy to trust after whatever a hundred years. Uh oh. We have John frozen oh, Jonathan. I think my guess is the reason Moret is such a threat is because she that was the closest Wakeman to her. That's my guess. That's my gut instinct. Well, and I also think that that speaks a lot to I trusted someone once. The first person maybe I trusted other than like let's let's assume that she is the bricklayer's granddaughter. Clearly she trusted him. Uh but if Marat was the first person that she trusted with this information and he betrayed her. I think that that speaks a lot to her. I mean, it, cause that's the thing, like, let's say you're a kid, right? You trust your parents and they're good parents. And then you openly trust, you know, the first person who, comes into your life who who opens up to you so you trust you trust them and you open up to them as well and then they betray you i think that speaks a lot to her lack of trust in the future and and I, edith is also a picture of that right like edith was edith was raised one way and then she was betrayed and it was like she had she lost that faith in humanity not now that doesn't happen with everybody but I mean, it shit. It hasn't happened with Senlin, honestly, as far as we can tell. But I think that that I, I do think that the idea of Marat knowing about the zoetrope speaks to why the Sphinx is so set on. I need people I can trust, and I don't trust literally anybody. But you, like Volita, for whatever reason, you've proven I can trust you. And Edith, obvious reason where she saved Adam, like. It might have been going against the Sphinx's wishes, but it shows that she's loyal, so I can trust you. <clears throat> so I, 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 I do think that him knowing about the zoetrope is probably more likely than him not, at least in my opinion. I think it makes sense, but I also think that, I think that, or rather, I don't think that he would have been the person that she trusted that then betrayed her, that caused her to not trust people, because she's described as incredibly old, and Marat is not. Which leaves no. me... But if she was... <sighs> sequest I mean, she's been sequestered, right? I mean, she trusts Byron. She trusts Byron. Yeah. So, and we don't know how long Byron has been there, but she's been sequestered up there for God knows how long. I, it's I, one of those I, things, though, that makes me think that, you know, like, she's obviously had these Wakemen and, like, stuff like this happening for a while, and she hasn't had another hand that we know of since that betrayal. And I just, I just don't know that there's enough evidence to say that Marat was the previous hand that betrayed her, that made her no longer trust people, just because we have no reason to believe yet that Marat is that old that could have been that like he wasn't her hand Nami he was her legs <laughs> Sorry. I've been slaying be I'm interesting to see Marat you hypothesis she had legs and the reason she's a triangle now is because Marat stole her <laughs> legs <laughs> The true betrayal. <laughs> or she gave them to him. You imagine. Oh, gosh, sorry, Nicole, what were you going to say? You think it'll be interesting to see? Just to see how that all plays out. Because we don't really have any no. reason to believe one way or the other, right? Like, yep. I would buy. These theories, okay. both sides of the theories make sense. But we don't know. Well, I guess some people have read further, but. Uh, at, at least up to this point, like I, I have no way of knowing how that all plays out. I'm also um, very interested in like what led Marat to be like fuck no Sphinx. I'm very yeah. interested in that motivation because, frankly, to me, the characters that are evil for the sake of evil being evil don't entertain me. I like the characters that well, are evil for a reason. And if he was literally just trying to help the Hods, right? If he, if that was a legitimate thing that he was mm -hmm. doing and not control them 
and keep them from learning, et cetera, then it would be more understandable. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, also, I saw how these how these enslaved people lived and knew I, I would also rise up very much accept a started off as truly trying to free the Hods, but eventually like fell into his own power and was corrupted by it story. Mm -hmm. I would also accept that. Either way, I want to know his motivations because it's going to make me more interested. I, 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 I'm torn about whether or not I would accept that only because he seems too smooth. He seems too smooth. Uh, yeah, he's so schmarmy. Yeah. I think you can acquire schmarm, though. I think I think schmarm, schmarm can be achievement acquired. unlocked. Schmarm. Just, you know, sometimes, sometimes you coat yourself in coconut oil to slide through the fence. Sometimes you coat yourself in schmarm because the power makes you power hungry. You know. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, yep. I would That's... buy it. On that note, <laughs> let's go back to someone who has no schmarm, aka Semlin. However, however. <laughs> Senlin and Edith. Oh. oh my god. So passionate kisses. Listen, I wasn't, I think that's a country song. Passionate kisses. Whoa, whoa. Yes, I, I was referencing a country Are you song. Really? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, I'm glad we're on the same page there. That was a horrible song. But I'm really glad I am not on that page. <laughs> Oh, you're gonna you're gonna be because I'm gonna send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> You've never heard that. Song. <laughs> okay, so wow. Uh, oh gosh, like I just uh, one thing I, I meant to I, I I meant to ask you guys. I put a comment in the document because so I have the uh, pre orbit version like pre bancroft getting picked up by a full on publisher version of the first two books so my version of arm of the sphinx has this odd quote it says i thought of the coincidental embraces we shared all the occasions when fate put us in each other's arms an innocent thing but not unaware not without feeling and i wanted to survive because if i did i knew i would see her again is that wrong is it wrong to miss what is unattainable no and i think oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. In the in my version, it says, "Is it wrong to miss what is attainable?" Yes, and that's what it says in my version okay, as well. Okay. And I remember sticking on that for a second, but I get what it means because what he's saying yeah. is that he misses Edith because he knows he can have her, whereas he is yeah. currently scared of missing Maria because Maria is out of reach. Maria okay. is unattainable. Edith and Edith's affections are attainable. And, and that's the thing. It was one of those things where it was like, I knew it could go either way, right? But I was like, I need to know if this was a typo because I, I, it was have, in my version too. I do have ye old version of this book. I have <laughs> ye same, newest. It's the same in the audiobook too. Okay. Okay. Perfect. That's all I needed to know. Um, I also loved, and this is actually a quote that eventually I think gets. I, I, I highlighted a lot of quotes from this book in our Sundays with Sass. So like, if you're not following us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, you should, because I highlight quotes in pretty graphics. But yeah, uh, it's so nice. I loved Edith's thought. She did not believe in idle visits to the pantry or idle walks down the lane or idle appearances outside doors in the wee hours of the night. These were not idle things. They were urges too inconvenient or unseemly to admit. They were hunger. They were frustration. They were yearning. Now, granted, I don't necessarily hear the idle walks down the lane thing. Sometimes I just want to go for a walk, right? It has nothing to do with frustration. But <laughs> Uh, idle walks to the pantry. I mean, it is it is either hunger or boredom. And uh, idle appearances outside doors in the wee hours of night. <laughs> Senlin. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. I mean, nobody goes to somebody's door in the middle of the night without. It's so funny. Because mm -hmm. not expecting something necessarily, but for sure desiring something. Corny thoughts. I think for me, this was like the kind of like most 
indicative of character development and the thing that I least expected, but also the thing that I understood the most with how everything had progressed. Cause like, I still very much believe that Senlin is like ace or something like that. Cause he doesn't really pay attention to sexual things, but I think affection and like kissing is not the same, but also I am not asexual, so I can't really make that distinction. But I think the desire for affection and physical closeness and romantic closeness is different from not having- I, th I, think, he's, I think he's demisexual. Yeah, and I think the fact that like he got to know, cause like even when he first meets Edith in the first book, he, like he very much comforts her, like in like when they're hanging off the side of the tower in a cage. Uh, the good old days. <laughs> but like, <laughs> it, it was one of those moments that like, I had kind of like, if Senlin had been any other character, I expected this like in that first, in the first book in the cage, like for that whole era to like that whole section to end with them, like with like some sort of romantic attachment there. And the fact that it happened now, I was kind of like, yeah, no, it's been a year. This makes sense. Like he's, he's sad. He's given up and his portrait of his wife just made him high as fuck. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I I think he's demisexual. I think it's it's an emotional mm -hmm. like when he when he gains that emotional attachment with somebody is when he moves to a physical attachment, right? Mm -hmm. And I think honestly, if that's what it is, and I really hope what it is, because how often do demisexuals get actual representation literally anywhere? You know, I mean asexuals for sure too, but I I, I do think that I I, I would very much veer toward that he's demisexual over asexual. That said, uh, he is still married. And at this point, I think he hasn't seen the proof that his wife is remarried. I can't remember. Did he just see the proof that she was remarried? No, he hasn't seen proof. Okay, so... We assume he realizes that she has been. Remarried. Obviously, she is in a situation where she is with another man. But I'm still just kind of torn about like, oh, like I love Senlin and Edith, but also, oh no, like it's one of those things that like I get it, I understand. This makes a lot of sense. This is morally not okay to me, but I still get it, and yeah. I cannot like I can't really be truly mad. Because the assumption that we are living with right now is that Senlin knows that his wife has been coerced into marrying and thus right. is it, like being forced to cheat on him. And like, I get all of these thoughts, but I, like very base morality, he is still married. This is still very wrong. And then also like understanding everything like motivations and everything is what makes it interesting and is also what makes me not immediately go hiss bad and it's the other thing that makes me go oh no sweetie stop yeah and i mean i think that like i don't know there's part there's a like there's a little part of you that's like what if they just became polyamorous later like what if they actually <laughs> rescue maria and they have a happy and they polyamorous Yes, I love it. Lovely. I love it. I don't know that this will happen, but there is a there is a part of me, and it's I I am not poly, right? But I absolutely have friends who have had very lovely experiences with it if it's done right. So I am in this like, oh, this might be really good for them. Bro. I am poly, and I want. It. Like I want that, <laughs> I, right? Like you want we that need representation. More and... representation, anyway. Ooh, like, quick aside, an important one: polyamorous rep representation. Read Iron Widow. It's by the person who wrote it. Um, they are the person, the um Chinese person who hmm. on YouTube has made like videos about like the accuracy of Mulan or the accuracy of like the live action Mulan and like everything wrong with live action Mulan. And they made that whole Twitter thread about it. It's, I haven't read it. I hilariously have two copies of it because I got very excited and I ordered two copies of it. It's a retelling of the story of Wu Zetian, who is the, um, the like female Chinese empress, except it's a retelling with 
what is basically Jaegers. It's like Pacific Rim. That's but, amazing. And I'm instead totally of a bored. love triangle between the main woman character who is that famous historical empress, it is her and her polyamorous boyfriends. I love it. Iron Widow. It's on my TBR. Would you like me to send you to send you a copy of the book because I have to? Sure. <laughs> I got you. Will I ever go Yay. to the post office? Who knows? Maybe First of all, I love how you were like the Iron Widow. It's it's written by the person who wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> well, my problem is that I can't pronounce their name correctly. Like I know how it's spelled, but I also know that the way that I want to pronounce it is not the like correct Chinese pronunciation mm -hmm. of it. I would rather not butcher it and just be like, this is the person who did this. <laughs> Cause I can't say names sometimes. And I'm good at words. Equally bad at English <sighs> and other languages. Uh, sorry guys, I'm getting messages from- It's okay. About I agree though. I'm here for the OT3. I love it. Yes. Yes. Let's same. It's okay. Mr. Hosea, can you please confirm the O two three? Thank you. So, what is the time frame at this point in the book? One year later. Yep. It's one year later. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can't remember where they wrote that, but I also finished reading this yesterday, so I can verify that there is. Yeah, nothing I, else I, I, I because some <laughs> of the other stuff that happened later, I was trying to. But I he specifically, look. Sinlin, I think specifically mentions that it's been about a year. Yes, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure that's right. It, it, it might have been a little less, but it's definitely close to that. Uh, so on that note, because this also kind of follows from them kissing the Sphinx's butterflies. Mm -hmm. Shit. Holy because shit. Well, that's why I was asking about the, the time frame, the, the child. Yep. yep. Is it is it Senlin's child or is it someone else's child? I think it is very likely that it is Senlin's child because it ends with her specifically being like, "Don't blame her," as in like, "Don't blame the the kid, the kid." And why would a father blame a kid if the kid isn't but his? Except I, we've got no indication up until that happened. I agree, but like the thing that bothers me about it is. Oh, yeah, Up no, we until no that, there was not even a kiss between them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like, you when had to assume they, they consummated their marriage. When did when they, they fuck? Jonathan, before when the did they started. fuck? Before Wait, when, the did, when, did who, when did who fuck? Sinlin and Maria. Oh, before no, no, no. The, yeah, they, 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 yeah, it's, it's before talked the about. Book in, started. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's mentioned like randomly in, I think, book one. Maybe book two. It was on the train. It was on the train when did they were they, on their way to the tower, for did sure. That mentioned? Yeah, yes, it absolutely did. It absolutely. The only did. thing I remember, and and I'm not saying it didn't happen, but I, the only thing I remember is her like trying to kiss on him and trying to like make moves on him, and him turning away. See, I remember that too, but then I also remember it being in, written in a way that made it sound like she kept trying and it was never clarified if he kept avoiding every advance. Maybe, and it, and Maybe that's what it Sinlin is. Was, Sinlin's POV was written in such a sexless way that I thought it was incredibly possible that they did and he just never talked about it because he was like, why would I mention weird flesh? Weird flesh. I mean, I definitely do think the baby is Sinlin's. Mm. I'm just, I was super confused by it because I was like, I don't remember them. Well, I didn't remember them either. Any... So I, I just assumed it happened before the book started. <laughs> mm -hmm. See, the weird thing to me is that I always felt like there was more sexual chemistry, even from when the, they first met between Sinlin and Edith, than there was between Sinlin and Maria. Oh, I because, agree. Because, like, even back when they were in the netting, Sinlin was like, oh, she's actually kind of attractive, but I can't think about that because I am married to Maria and I have to fight Maria. I think interestingly enough, to me, the way that read though was more that like 
Fenlon never let himself notice Maria because he also mentions it in this book, like part of like the Maria hallucinations is like, like one of the Maria hallucinations specifically calls him out for like marrying his former student and he, and it, and like calls him like basically a dirty old man for it. And like, I think it very much highlights that like the hallucinations are telling him things that he doesn't want to hear. And I think that because Senlin thought that he was always very careful to desex Maria in his head, even though they were later intimate after they were married and after they were, after he was allowed to view her in that manner. And I think, I think that's sort of the way that I like read it on future. Cause like, all of his descriptions of Maria to me before that moment, he was more I, for Maria. For me, it always struck me as like the things he noticed about her first were like her personality and her intelligence on all, all of that, because he grew up with her. Like he, he basically grew up seeing her as a teenager and like seeing her grow from a child. Oh, well, he was an a, let me, he was an adult. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no, no. but like, but like, yeah. he saw her as a child growing up to become a person. So he saw her at a time when she wasn't like a sexual object to him. But when he meets Edith, she is immediately like a grown woman, and therefore able to be viewed in that capacity. Because like, obviously, like you, we know that he's a prude, but we also know he has eyes because like the whole thing was like that lady with the titties out and the legs out. He was like, titties, legs, oh. So like, clearly he has these eyes, but I think for Maria, since he met her in such a different way, I think she was a little bit desexed in his head until she was allowed to be not that. And then I also think that that colored his later descriptions of her because he was so busy in his head trying to not be the dirty teacher because that was clearly a thought that was in his head because it comes out of the hallucination. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what I think. Obviously, this is like very much reading very deeply into it. But I also think, mm -hmm. you know, as evidenced by like, I, I ran and being menopausal and what that helps us that what that shows us about her that Bancroft is like very much capable of writing more nuance into his stories without actually writing it. And I think his hallucinations of Maria, like, very much functioned as like his conscious just like throwing barbs at him and i think one of those barbs was that he did feel like the dirty teacher despite never actually seeing her as a sexual object or interacting or or having any or like not he doesn't kiss her and like she kisses him when she's a woman when she leaves and that's the only moment where like that happens but he still feels that guilt because he's like it me dirty old man even though in this one case he is not dirty old man. Can't believe I'm defending what could have been dirty old man. <laughs> Sedlin, thou art truly pure of intent. <laughs> I you so much. My my sweet, my sweet naive bookman. So yeah, I mean, at the end, we're left with Sedlin fucking spying on Edith and you mean the Sphinx? I'm sorry, the, yeah, the yeah. Sphinx spying on Edith and Senlin. Yep. Uh, Byron feels bad about it though, which is good, I guess, mm -hmm. considering he put the spy there. And Byron's and, a mensch, y'all. And then uh, we get this fit of footage of Maria with her baby. I, I think the thing that tipped me off was like when she asks, like, you won't blame her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what tip me off no, right? absolutely. That was the thing that was like, wait a second. Did they fuck? They must have fucked. Mm -hmm. That was the moment where I also thought that. And then I thought back into when they could have possibly fucked. And I was like, it must have been on the train, right? And then I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Sonalus was just talking about distracting, but he never mentioned that she stopped or that he was successful. Oh no! We lost Jonathan! Oh no, he's gone forever. He just was, he got annoyed by me saying fuck too much. <laughs> I highly doubt that. <laughs> well, hopefully he comes back, but I mean, in conclusion, uh I you know the end of this book was a big boom 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 boom. You know, we yeah. what 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 
I mean, we've been one hour and 44 minutes into this thing right now. And yep. what the last episode we did was like only an hour because we were just like, we, there's a lot to talk about, a lot of pages, but not much happens really. I feel but like this the, is... second, the second half of this book was just like Oprah handing out plot twists. You get a plot twist. You get a plot twist. You get a plot twist. <laughs> just everywhere. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know if Jonathan is coming back, but on that note, I'm going to close us out with a quote because I like this quote and I think it is very pertinent to the current times. When humanity ceases to aspire, it begins to decline. Do you know why the status quo is so tyrannical and nauseating? Because it does not exist. There is no status in the world and certainly not where humans are involved. The status quo is just a pleasing synonym for decay. Depressing, but true. And on that note, Mm -hmm. we will be back in two weeks covering parts one and two of The Hod King, book three in Josiah Bancroft's Books of Babel series. Once again, I'm Tara, along with Nick, Jonathan, Oh, he's back. Ooh, he's back. All right, we're, 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 it's, it's a, you're it's just signing off. We're we're signing off because we we right. we've we've been very long here. So right. you know, once again, I'm Tara, along with Nick, Jonathan, and Ami. Thank you for joining us for Sagas and Sass, and we'll see you next time. Right. Bye. 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 Bye.